afternoon and welcome to another episode of MIT's Computational Law Idea Flow series. And today we're going to actually pull the curtain back, in a sense, on some of the research happening at home in our lab at MIT Media Lab uh, from one of our very own PhD students who also, um, I think very interestingly, is doing a concurrent degree, um, getting his law degree at Harvard. Um, so we've got a really good example here of uh, law and technology um, kind of hybrid of the of the uh, warrior king type that we always advocate. And uh, and so uh, or maybe philosopher king would be a, a better a better example of the blend. And uh, and uh, and his name is Robert Mahari. You've heard him before in this series in the past um, as, uh, as part of a demo of a different research project on AI generated music and all the interesting copyright implications of that. But now we're gonna delve in even more on point for uh, the topic of computational law and take a look at two very interesting research projects that Robert's been um, at the center of in the Media Lab that uh, exemplify how to surface um, actionable insights from legal data in two very interesting different ways that help us sort of scope out the answer to the fundamental question, what is or what could computational law be in the first place? Uh, and so with that in mind, uh, I, I wanted to say um, also that Robert is a member of our advisory board of the computational law report and uh, and just a cherished member of the community and i'm so glad that you're willing to and able to share um some of your kind of behind the scenes research with us today robert um and so uh please uh, go ahead and, and to the extent that you'd like to fill out your uh kind of bio a little bit from my rather you know single point of view introduction of you um i invite you to to introduce yourself more fully and to um share your projects with us now thank you thank you so much daza uh as always the introduction was very flattering so i will add nothing um and and leave it at that uh but it's always a pleasure to be with this group um and and i'm glad to be back and so like daza said so i'll, I'll share two projects uh that were two research projects that we're working on. Um, I'll, I'll follow a maybe slightly unusual format in that I'll kind of give you a high level overview of both projects and then dive into kind of some of the details and some of the technical details. But I would really appreciate, you know, stop me along the way uh, if anything is unclear or also if you just have questions, remarks, these are both ongoing. Uh, so, so we're still, you know, very much like looking for feedback and trying to integrate new feedback. So with that, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, and that seems to be working. And then let's see if I can do this. Um, cool. So now you guys can see that, right? Um, good. Yeah. So <clears throat> the first of the two projects uh, relates to, so both projects actually uh, focus on legal citations. So uh, in, in common law jurisdictions like the United States, um, like you know, England, um, judges and lawyers rely on citations to precedent to build their arguments. Uh, and so the first project says, well, you know, that's really similar to how scientists operate, right? We, we have this knowledge system that builds on prior knowledge through citation, um, where the citations serve to compress and store knowledge for the future. Um, and, and there are patterns that we, we've observed in scientific citations. So there's this uh, discipline known as science of science that is sought to understand how science is done, why certain scientific ideas uh, become popular, why certain scientists become popular. Um, but we don't know if these patterns that have been identified are unique to science and all the kind of weird historical accidents that made science operate the, the way it does today, or whether there's something fundamental about, you know, the human pursuit of knowledge. And law, which also relies on citation, um, is appears to be a really different system, right? So a couple of the differences between law and science uh, are, are the strictness of the hierarchy, right? Uh, you, if the Supreme Court says something, that's, that goes. Um, if, if someone at MIT says something, you can disagree with them. Uh, there's no kind of strict hierarchy. Um, judges don't get to pick uh, what disputes they work on. There's a little bit of specialization. We have bankruptcy court, courts and tax courts, but beyond that, you don't get to pick uh, what kind of disputes arise in your courtroom. Scientists go out and they find problems. They specialize and then they're restricted, but for the most part, they're, they're free. Um, judges also serve uh, for life and scientists very much come and go. Um, 
judges, the judges we're focusing on are, are uh, federal judges. Um, so judges that are appointed by the US president and then confirmed by the Senate. Of course, there are all sorts of judges uh, in the United States too, but those are the ones we're focusing on. So we identify three, so, so we actually checked all sorts of different citation patterns and, and I'll tell you about more than just these three, but kind of everything that we compared between law and science, we find similarity. Uh, three kind of interesting patterns are uh, this law of preferential attachment. So if you, you've been cited highly in the past, uh, that is indicative uh, in signs that you'll be cited a lot in the future. Um, you might imagine that this makes it difficult for kind of new ideas uh, to uh, compete sometimes, right? Because if there's one thing that gets cited all the time for a certain proposition, then that's kind of set in stone. We find the same thing in uh, the law. The second, maybe more surprising, and I think for, for scientists more upsetting, is this rule of random impact. Your, your most impactful publication could come at any point in your life. Um, if you have a really impactful publication early, uh, that could be it. Uh, it can come really late in your career. There, there doesn't seem to be, for example, a tremendous value in experience um, in, in terms of just being able to attract citations. And finally, we have these citations that go um, unpublished, uh, yeah, un, uncited for a long time, uh, referred to as diamonds in the rough or sleeping beauties. And we find them uh, in both law and in science. And I'll give you a kind of a fun example of a legal sleeping beauty uh, a little bit uh, down the line. So now switching gears a little bit, um, whoops. Let's see if I can, yes. So switching gears a little bit. Um, we, we have these legal citations, right? And so we can do something completely different with them. Namely, we can think about, uh, I told you they're, they're critical to making arguments. So we can think about, well, can you predict what legal citation to use in order to make your argument? And uh, to formalize this a little bit, so what do these citations look like? They're not just judicial opinions as a whole, right? You're usually citing something specific in a prior judicial opinion, like a certain passage that might represent a legal text. And so the question um, that we looked at for the second project uh, is given a legal argument that you'd like to make, uh, can we predict using natural language processing and specifically this uh, model known as the BERT model, uh, can, can we predict the uh, missing precedent? Um, and the way we approach it, and, and you'll hear more about this uh, in a moment, uh, is we, we say, well, you know, in a way we can kind of construct mini arguments from uh, judicial opinions by taking the introduction, the conclusion as global context that tell us you know, what's going on in the case in general, and then text before and after a, uh, a thing that is cited by somebody else, right? So for example, text before and after a legal text, a test um, as like local context that tell us about what the judge is writing about um, in the instant case. And so we can mine these kind of mini arguments uh, or mini opinions uh, from lots of different uh, judicial opinions. We use 1.7 million federal judicial opinions to do that um, and train a model. And then we can take that model and give it kind of more reasonable, more real legal arguments. And we find that uh, it does tremendously well at predicting uh, missing legal precedent. And uh, this has interesting implications on access to justice on the one hand, but just like judicial efficacy and, and uh, the efficacy of lawyers. So two different projects, both related to citations. Um, I will start digging into the first one and some of the technology and kind of research we've done. Uh, but I wanted to pause at this stage. If, if anyone has questions or remarks, um, feel free. Yeah, in, including just clarifying questions, like to make sure you understood sure. what uh, Robert was saying or, or anything else at this point. Because we, 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 he's not kidding when we say we're about to dig in. So <laughs> like this is a comfortable platform to get off, uh, off and stretch your legs for a minute if you want to. I've got something real quick. I mean, Robert, you might address this uh, as we're about to jump in. If you do, obviously, if you're about to do that, obviously, just, uh, you know, ignore ignore me. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so I have a background as a scientist, like uh, my degrees are in chemistry and physics. And uh, yeah, I published loads of papers and then got, got tired and wandered off. And um, one of the other things that I see is the difference between like, you know, hard science, at least, and law is, um, uh, the desire for or the kind of um, presence of the notion of objectivity in the scientific domain, you know, at least in an epistemic sense, the idea that so, there seem to be some facts that are knowable uh, in the epistemic domain of science, whereas everything in law seems to be very much relative and um, subjective and uh, more on sort of circumstantial. I wonder if that's also something that's informed um, 
this uh, similarity and difference seeking you've been doing across the fields? So we haven't we haven't thought about this explicitly, and I wonder. I would wonder how many judges, if you, if you polled judges, you know, and you ask them to what degree do you think the law is something subjective, I I, I would think that a, a surprising majority would say, you know, it's it's actually very objective. Like we have these statutes and we have case law, and we're we're highly constrained in you know, and you can have like there's a separate like moral question, like are these laws good or just or something like that, but like it is what it is, and and seems reasonably kind of like uh, it, it binds you. Um, at the same time, right, like it binds you in a sense that certainly feels more arbitrary than like laws of nature, right? You know, things fall because they fall and there's gravity and there's nothing you can do about that. But there are things you can do about the tax code. Um, and so so it's, it's interesting in that sense. Uh, but I, I would, I would uh, add that to the list of differences between the two systems that make the similarities all the more surprising, perhaps. Um, nice yeah. framing. Good looking forward to the rest of the talk. Thanks. <laughs> I think I'll dive into it and then, then people can interrupt me as, as we go. Um, so, so I mentioned already, um, we, we have uh, legal citations kind of core uh, to, to making arguments. Here's a nice um, example of the chaotic convention. Uh, this convention, I think it, it happened in um, Minnesota. Um, goes completely, you know, off the rails. It's in a hotel. Someone brings in a mule. Someone else brings in an alligator. People are firing guns. And so the Minnesota Supreme Court is tasked with uh, resolving this case and saying, well, is the hotel liable? Um, and so then they cite um, this case in New Jersey that says, um, well, yes, uh, if, if a hotel knows of the danger um, that its guests are causing and, you know, when they're firing guns, that seems like pretty clear. Um, then, then it's liable. So done. The hotel is liable. This is like a pretty typical um, example of of how citations are used, and we'll use these kinds of examples um, th throughout. So, um, let's see. Uh, I, I've already talked about kind of the the differences between law and science. Uh, although they both use citations, they they have lots of differences. We just talked about an, an additional one, but we have this hierarchy. Um, the fact that scientists are free and uh, judges are uh, confined. Another big difference is just the number. Um, we have relatively few judges. There's like 6,000-ish um, district court judges, uh, appeals court judges, and Supreme Court judges in U.S. history. Um, and, and there's you know, millions of scientists. Uh, and then there's this uh, lifetime uh, appointment. Um, and so then like diving into uh, the similarities, and I'm sorry that the graphs don't look so nice, uh, it's weird, but uh, the first thing, hopefully it's, it's still clear enough. Uh, the first thing is the, the number of uh, opinions and uh, the number of scientific um, publications have both been growing exponentially. Um, so you can kind of make it out so the, the axes are on the log scale, um, but you know, exponential growth is always a little bit surprising because it can't continue forever. Um, like kind of by definition, it, it can't, you know, it consumes everything, right? So like uh, why, why these things have been growing temporarily, uh, exponentially um, for the time being kind of remains unclear, but both systems are, are growing exponentially um, in the time that we've been observing them. Um, second, there's a mostly constant number of uh, citations received by an individual paper. So over time, over the hundred or so years that we've been looking at it, the, the number, the average number of citations is constant. You see the drop um, with scientific citations towards the end. That's simply because they, they haven't existed long enough to get cited, right? So it takes some time for you to accumulate citations, um, but you can see kind of the number of citations has remained constant despite the exponential growth, right? Um, and so what does that mean? That means that there's a growing number of references contained in each uh, publication. So that means that in order to make your argument, uh, you have to cite more things. Um, and so that suggests that kind of the complexity of arguments um, and, and the you know, number of citations, number of uh, maybe sub arguments you're making uh, has grown in both science and law. Um, so this is kind of you know, relatively basic. Uh, so we can kind of move on to more sophisticated uh, uh, comparisons. And uh, one such comparison is the um, impact that individual authors have. Right, so uh, clearly, you know, uh, an individual judge has tremendous impact on on anyone that comes before her. But uh, there's this kind of idea of impact over time, right? Like how how much are you cited? How much are you remembered? 
Um, there are judges that come up uh, in law school classrooms hundreds of years later, um, even though you know others that other contemporary judges are forgotten. The same is very much true of scientists. And so we can measure this uh, individual uh, impact, and it's known as a Q factor um, based on work done by by some other folks. Um, reason, yeah, there. Um, and so we can measure this Q factor and we can um, kind of uh, stratify judges and scientists into uh, groups of high, low, um, and um, middle impact uh, authors. And we see that uh, in both cases, uh, if you're a high impact author, you, you simply publish more. Um, and so, you know, there's a question about correlation and causation, but the fact is that uh, in, in both uh, systems, you publish more. This is especially su surprising in, in law, and, and I don't actually have a good answer for it yet, because uh, nominally you're kind of assigned cases at, at random. Um, and so the question how it's even possible for one judge to publish significantly more than other judges is kind of not super clear. I mean, the obvious answer is like, you know, some judges are judges for longer, uh, but that doesn't quite answer it. Um, that, that doesn't fully explain it. Uh, but in any case, so you, you publish more uh, if you're high impact. Um, second, the average impact um, of, of authors is relatively constant over their careers. Um, again, surprising in law because uh, you, you can get promoted from the district court to the court of appeals or to the Supreme Court. We would expect your impact to rise um, quite significantly. But it seems like for, for whatever reason, if you look at the whole system, um, either you're kind of high impact from the start um, or not. And, and that is true in, in, in both cases. And then finally, um, I mentioned this uh, random impact rule. Um, so essentially your, uh, your most impactful publication can come at any point um, uh, of your career. The, the charts are a little confusing, so the graphics, essentially what we do is we uh, plot the uh, actual uh, kind of in, uh, timing uh, of the highest impact publication. And then we compare it to uh, a, a random timing. So you know we we shuffle uh, the the timing for each author's sequence of publications, and uh, the fact that the blue line and the orange line coincide mostly uh, suggests essentially that there's not a lot of difference between uh, the uh, random shuffling and the actual sequence of publications uh, for authors, um, and that suggests that there's this kind of rule of random impact. Um, so. So the next thing uh, that we looked at are the Sleeping Beauties. Um, and like I mentioned, they're uh, papers uh, in science or opinions in law that uh, kind of are invisible for a long time and then suddenly experience um, a, um, an, an uptick. And so here you see a really dramatic example on the right um, where uh, you have, uh, you know, goes unnoticed from the early 80s uh, to the mid 2000s and then suddenly uh, this opinion receives um, a ton of uh, citations uh, and then drops off dramatically. Um, and so we can calculate this uh, sleeping beauty coefficient that measures um, this, uh, this kind of surprise uh, factor. Uh, that's based on the publication year, the number of citations received um, in a given year and the number uh, and the year when the maximum is achieved. Um, and uh, th there's some details about how we calculate it using this reference line. Uh, that's the dotted line here. Um, but that's not super important. Uh, but I'd, I'll, I'd like to give you an example. That's the case that we just saw, which is United States v. Hooten. So this was uh, published in the Ninth Circuit, I believe, uh, in 1982. Um, and uh, it goes unsighted until 2002, and then it's cited over a thousand times. And uh, the interesting thing is that the case uh, stood for the proposition that the question raised in an appeal is so insubstantial as to require no further argument. And so each of the uh, thousand times that it's cited by the uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, it's cited as part of a super short opinion that essentially says, you know, there's no substantial question, see Hooten, uh, goodbye. And it's like one sentence opinions. Uh, and uh, presumably, but we haven't actually found where this happens, presumably someone said at some point, guys, you can't do this anymore. Um, or a different opinion uh, arose and it can, the practice continues, but a different opinion is cited for the same proposition. Um, but it's a very convenient thing. Uh, and so uh, we can see this kind of like rapid rise and then drop. Um, and so uh, comparing again, science and law, um, we see that uh, the district, you, you have to believe me because the, uh, the figures don't really show it as clearly as I'd like, but uh, the distribution of these sleeping beauty coefficients is really similar. 
um, as is kind of the uh, distribution of awakening times, how long it takes um, for uh, a case to be noticed. Um, and so we're kind of figuring out, you know, how, how to explain this and also what is the significance of these sleeping beauties. Um, and you would think that kind of with, uh, with, with improved technology in both systems, you would accept, uh, expect these sleeping beauties to become rarer. Uh, but that doesn't really seem to be the case. Um, I mean, we just talked about a pretty uh, recent example. Um, th this continues to happen. Um, so, so these are, uh, you know, a couple of uh, uh, surprising to us similarities um, between the two systems, despite their um, their tremendous differences. Um, and so, the the main takeaway uh, for us is, well, you know, we can probably transfer approaches from one system to the other. And um, if we think, for example, about the Q-factor model, uh, that helps us assess the quality of, uh, of an author. And so you could imagine that uh, the American Bar Association, when they um, make kind of their competency assessment of judges, could use a metric like that um, to, to assess you know, how, how good is a judge. Um, so, so this is kind of this work, relatively academic. Um, any questions on that? Uh, because otherwise, I'll dive into the uh, NLP side. Uh, of things. Let's see, there's also chat questions. Uh, maybe if you could just say one thing before you get to auto law, yeah. and I think there's going to be a lot of interest in auto law um, uh, in discussion. So, uh, could you just talk a, a little bit more about how? Um, so I, one of the things I think that's interesting, just to back up, uh, in terms of showing this sort of so, quote behind the curtains, end quote look at what's happening in this research lab um, at MIT um, with respect to computational law is how did it arise? Uh, and so could you just say a couple of things about why why from from our team and what 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 uh, prof what that professor is doing with science of science that you mentioned but didn't describe and then how we're how you have the glimmer of an idea to apply that technique within the legal space and then that you know, cascaded to to a bunch of breakthroughs. But you just to, just describe that, like where did this arise from, and what is science of science? Yeah, totally. So so YY is is one of our collaborators. Um, he he was a visiting uh, professor uh, from uh, Indiana uh, in our group, and uh, studies you know signs of science and networks more broadly. Um, and so what happened was, uh, I think about a year ago now. Um, I had uh, extracted the citation network uh, from uh, a uh, data provider called uh, the Case Law Access Project, which is uh, out of Harvard, um, and they uh, <laughs> conveniently uh, scanned all uh, U.S. Uh, case law, like almost eight million opinions, um, and and converted them to uh, plain text using uh, OCR. Um, and so that that's kind of where it arose. But you know, kind of to take a step back and kind of think more philosophically about it, right? Uh, why, why, and and that whole community of science of science uh, researchers uh, think about you know how how can we evaluate the the process of doing science kind of like how can we assign qu uh, quantitative metrics to it uh, how can we understand if it's working well if it's working poorly uh, and it seems like you know we have a lot of the same questions about the law but we don't really have the tools to to talk about it right I mean uh, I, I think there's often the kind of pervasive view that like the law is working not so good sometimes, but like better than long time ago and better in some places than in other places. Uh, but, but that's all very qualitative. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, this paper doesn't do this, but I think it scratches at this idea. Well, you know, can we assess the, the quality of the law uh, and the quality of judges and, and can we do it in an empirical way at scale. Um, so I think I, I, I think that's what you were getting at, Daza. Um, so that's kind of the, the background. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Um, yep, it is helpful. Yeah. And so just in the and in the spirit of idea flow, um, just just please recognize everybody that um, you know ideas from one field and endeavor um, can sometimes be adopted and adapted in other fields, and that there's some you know maybe superficial. Um, layers in which they're all but identical, like citation networks in scientific papers and in, and uh, but but at a deeper level, I guess I will say one more thing substantively that you may or may not be aware of, Robert. But um, part of what I love about this project is that that when you look at the scientific method itself, um, 
you can see that um, it, 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 to, to a, a material extent, it arrived um, on the shoulders of the law. Uh, and the processes, of, among other things, um, I'm thinking in common law, England, of um, you know, what is the process for um, finding truth in the legal system? Um, you know, you have an adversarial process. Um, you know, you have the opportunity to cross-examine. You assume nothing. You have to prove everything. How do you prove something beyond a, a certain, you know, kind of um, burden? Um, you know, what what is evidence it, to start with? Uh, and uh, and there's other approaches as well that were adopted at, at the, you know, during the beginning of the age of reason as part of how we establish facts, in fact, about the natural universe. You mentioned gravity very poignantly as something that was different. Well, same, different, different, but same in certain respects. And there's some great books that detail, you know, what the lineage of legal systems to the scientific method was. Uh, and so now that finally, just a you know, a few hundred years later, uh, the law is starting to catch up to science and become more computational and empirical in some ways. I think it's all too poignant and fitting that we should borrow back from our cousins, um, you know, more advanced techniques. And uh, but at the end of the day, aren't we all um, seeking um, truth uh, by some definition? So anyway, with all that, those uh, philosophical um, kind of mutterings aside, uh, let's dig into auto law, Robert, because I think that one is like right on point for what we're doing. Can I ask a stupid question first? It's a stupid question yeah. because I don't know. I don't know thing. anything. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't know anything about the law, so like uh, it may be stupid. But so, so we're using uh, we're comparing citation dynamics as on the slide now, and uh, one of the things that's interesting that has come up in uh, scientific discourse around publishing recently is the notion of negative citation. So like you're citing a mm. thing not because you think it's a good work the opposite in fact and i don't know if this, a, cor a, a, a corresponding phenomenon exists in the citation dynamics of law i imagine you're citing things uh, because you want to build arguments based on them so you're implying that they're good uh, by citing them and well, i don't so, know if that would factor into your analysis so so uh it doesn't factor into our analysis um in neither so so we don't worry about negative citations in either the scientific or the legal data set but such a thing exists in the law too right um, and specifically, you know, uh, higher courts can overturn lower courts and will almost inevitably cite um, the, the relevant opinions um, in, in some form. So it definitely happens. And in fact, if you go on to the kind of for-profit uh, big uh, legal search engines, they will uh, tell you whether an opinion is still good law. Um, and, and that involves kind of whether or not it's been overturned. Uh, so uh, very much kind of important to the practice of law um, and, and a real thing. Uh, yeah. Cool. All right. I'll, I'll move on to the next, uh, to the next project then to auto law. And so, you know, we're still dealing with citations, but a very different question, which is, um, given a legal argument, can we predict what you should cite? Can we predict relevant, not just opinions, but passages of opinions, um, that, uh, you, you ought to cite? Um, and that's uh, kind of uh, for the purposes of most of this, um, I will focus on a subtask, uh, namely given the context around a quoted passage of precedent in a judicial opinion, can we predict the passage? Um, and then I'll go back to kind of the original task towards the end. Um, and so this is a convenient way of, of handling the problem, right? So we have one opinion that quotes another opinion. Um, so I know, first of all, that whatever's written around the quote relates to the argument that's being made. And second of all, I know what is being quoted because I can map that back to the original opinion. Um, so how do we treat this kind of from a technical point of view? Uh, we treat it as a multi-class classification problem. Um, this is generally surprising to people because they say, well, you must have a ton of these passages and we do. Um, so how can you treat it as a fixed number of classes? Um, and the way we can do it is because uh, these uh, citations obey um, a really long tail distribution. So. Although there are like 1.5 million unique cited passages of precedent um, in you know, US case law, um, again, this is all federal law, um, the top 5,000 alone account for 20% of all references. Um, and so for the purposes of this auto law project, we focus on these 5,000. Um, and as you'll see towards the end, these 5,000 don't seem to relate to any like one area of law in particular too much. Um, so you can use them kind of different legal settings and still get really interesting results and, and predict really useful precedent. Um, and I'll compare two uh, different types of models. The first is, uh, it, it maybe doesn't look that way, but it's a really simple uh, model kind of uh, as far as the NLP uh, literature is concerned. So 
It's uh, kind of like a simple neural network uh, that uses a uh, simple uh, way of uh, taking words uh, and embedding them, representing them as vectors that doesn't take into account, you know, the words uh, surrounding. So uh, whatever, you know, each word in any context will always get the same vector assigned to it. Um, and we train those uh, vector uh, embeddings using lots and lots of legal text. Uh, the second is a fine-tuned uh, legal BERT model. So BERT is uh, a much more sophisticated uh, approach to doing these natural language models uh, that um, was, um, uh, you know, kind of has become the state of the art. Um, and some folks have uh, trained a legal BERT uh, that has been fine-tuned on uh, legal data. And so we take that and we then further fine-tune it um, on, on this uh, multi-class classification problem. Uh, and so to remind you, um, what we do is we, we identify uh, these uh, kind of missing quotes um, and we uh, generate many opinions uh, by taking uh, text from the introduction and the conclusion of opinions, as well as text from right before and uh, right after the passage. Uh, we uh, generate 7.4 million mini opinions in total, uh, and half a million of those correspond to the 5,000 most cited passages. So there's a lot of training data that we don't use, and, and you could definitely kind of build this out um, into a, uh, a full product by uh, using, you know, much more uh, of this data. But, um, you know, this is, this is technical, but we do some uh, pre-processing, kind of cleaning things up. Um, we, um, yeah, honestly, most of this is, is probably... Uh, not actually helpful, but what, what one of the challenges that you have when you do these uh, neural networks, maybe it's interesting, is uh, you, you have a class imbalance problem. So if you have uh, this power law distribution that I told you about that, um, you know, some, some categories are far, vastly overrepresented, then uh, your neural network uh, can just predict those really common categories and it won't be wrong that often. And so um, for the simple neural networks, you, you need to find ways to overcome that. And you can do this thing uh, called um, balancing um, and where you kind of synthetically generate training uh, examples. So I told you, you know, these training examples are in some vector space. And if this one is uh, category one and this one is category one, then we can assume that anything that is between them is also in category one. Um, and so this is kind of this synthetic oversampling technique just to help us with this class imbalance. Um, whereas BERT uh, allegedly can handle class imbalance, uh, kind of there's some research on that. Uh, so we don't do this balancing um, and uh, we, we kind of follow the, the industry standard in terms of how we, we train the models. Um, and the results um, are, are really quite exciting. Um, so uh, the macro and the weighted uh, averages uh, here um, corresponds to uh, how well the model does kind of on the data as a whole and how well the model does uh, if we remove the, the imbalance issue. Um, and so you can see that uh, the BERT model um, has uh, a really high uh, weighted uh, performance. Um, so, so it kind of gets it right 72% uh, of the time. Um, it does a little bit worse uh, on the macro level, um, but you'll, you'll, you'll see, so these numbers don't seem that great, right? Like 37% doesn't seem that great. Um, but, uh, in fact, this is kind of surprising, right? So like 30% of the time it picks the right passage out of 5,000. Um, yeah. and it, so, uh, hard to put in, but don't seem that great compared to maybe your dream, but they seem incredible compared to everything I've ever tried. I mean, like, I think the big news is that this is working at all. Um, just sorry to interrupt you, but like, come on. <laughs> Well, so, so it gets better. So uh, a lawyer wouldn't actually use it this way, right? A lawyer wouldn't just say, give me one passage and I'm going to cite that and move on with my life. Uh, what a lawyer would do is say, give me 10 passages or 20 passages and um, I'll use those. And here we get, really get like kind, kind of fantastic uh, performance. So um, we, the BERT model kind of gets it right, um, gets the right passage um, among the top 10 results 96% of the time. And even the feed forward neural network, even the kind of simple approach uh, gets it right 80% of the time. Um, so uh, this is really encouraging, right? Like this suggests uh, that, that you could actually use this, um, you know, with the caveat that we're focusing on common uh, citations, but, uh, you know, this begs the question, like, is, is that really a problem? Like is focusing on the, on the common uh, citations a problem? And the way um, I tried to get around this uh, is let's construct some like real examples uh, and see, you know, like, does, does this make sense? Um, like, does what the model predicts make sense? And so um, we, we did this um, by kind of testing it in the wild. 
Um, the, and, and what we do is we take two uh, legal briefs um, that uh, were, were written uh, by kind of like you know, preeminent lawyers. Um, and we summarize one argument um, in, in the brief and then we see uh, what, what are the results. So um, the first brief that uh, I looked at um, written by you know, Solicitor General um, and now US Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan, the whole brief is 86 pages long. But the argument that I focus on um, is that the petitioner's right to a fair trial was not violated um, because the pretrial, uh, because during pretrial uh, th there was a lot of publicity, right? Um, so you might imagine, you know, someone could say, "Well, you know, everybody know, everybody uh, is saying that I'm guilty. It's in all the newspapers. Like, how could I possibly have um, a fair trial?" Um, that was kind of the argument. And of the ten um, passages that were predicted by the model, uh, three appeared kind of completely irrelevant. Uh, three uh, were uh, relevant and, and actually appeared in the brief. Um, two belonged to an opinion from which a different passage is cited. Um, and two uh, appeared, at least to me, uh, relevant but were not cited. Um, and, and this to me is like really fantastic, right? It's a pretty specific legal question. Um, and yet uh, the model is able to predict you know, relevant precedent. So we try this again um, on a different legal brief, um, which was uh, kind of won uh, awards as the best ever legal brief. Uh, the argument here is that an alien uh, that was stopped, so, so kind of uh, an immigrant that was stopped at the U.S. border, uh, has a constitutional right to be free from false imprisonment and the use of excessive force. Um, so uh, here the question is, you know, uh, if, if someone who is potentially coming into the United States illegally, do, do they get the same constitutional protections um, as a U.S. citizen? That kind of question. Um, no, you know, super different legal contexts uh, from before. Uh, and yet uh, the results are, are really quite good as well. So three irrelevant results. Um, one uh, of the results actually appears in the brief. Uh, five belong to a, an opinion from which a different passage is actually cited and one appears relevant, uh, but isn't cited. So uh, this, this seems you know, incredibly encouraging, at least to me, uh, and, and, and suggests that these kind of like uh, NLP approaches uh, could really uh, do a lot of good. Um, and uh, they too, can do good in at least two ways, right? Like first by just improving the quality of legal arguments, right? Kind of giving people tools to make better arguments. Um, but second, and perhaps more importantly, uh, by, by lowering the barriers for access to justice in various ways, right? They reduce the, the costs associated with judging. So, you know, judges can get through more cases, there's less of a backlog, uh, but they also uh, make it cheaper for someone to uh, work with a lawyer and kind of be able to make arguments in court. Um, but even before you even get to court, right? Uh, you might be in a settlement negotiation and you want to know, well, if we did take this to court, like what, what does it look like? Um, and and this kind of, these kinds of approaches could, could help you. There's lots of room for uh, more uh, work uh, so we could you know, evaluate it on more real legal briefs. Um, we could uh, go you know, much further than these 5,000 most common cited passages. Um, we could think about you know, a slightly different problem, namely, assessing the quality of a legal argument um, by maybe, you know, uh, thinking out loud a little bit, uh, what, what does the model think you should cite versus what did you actually cite? Um, and, and kind of, a, you know, assigning scores to that. Um, or maybe given what you actually cited, what might you be missing? All sorts of things like that. Um, so with that, um, I've reached the end of my kind of double presentation and, and I'm excited for your feedback and questions. Um, and I hope that was interesting. Yay, thank you so much. That was so great. Um, okay, well, the, the floor is open. Um, we, we do want to reserve a few minutes at the end to um, bring you all into the fold on a cool initiative uh, that Brian is uh, mostly leading on composable governance, but um, and, and Wasim's going to share some thoughts that I think are good examples of the direction we want to go. But um, right now, the floor is open. Um, and I guess the question is, how much do you love that? what Robert just said, huh? No, I'm sorry. The question is, do you have any questions or comments um, or ideas or objections? Okay. So one thing that, most, yeah, yeah I, I, I was talking with Daz earlier in the week and one thing that we were discussing um, related to the auto law project would be that it would be really interesting just to see what the kind of like buckets of law are and oh, hold on. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, one, I'm sorry, Brian, but um, some of that is not yet announced. But uh, oh. say like 
I'm working on a follow on project um, that, you know, could be cool, but okay. uh, but we got to choose the right time to, or, to talk about that stuff. I like, didn't mean especially after I have any that. idea that it might work would be the best time. <laughs> I'm sorry uh, to interrupt you. Yeah. Just let me rewind then. Okay. And, I'm sorry, uh, man. I'll, uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll pass it back to the floor. Okay, I'm sorry, Brian. <laughs> but look, if you guys um, make it into our lab, then you too can see um, crazy ideas that may or may not work before if we choose to announce them or not. Uh, and somebody else was starting to speak, I think, at the same time. Who was that? Might have been me. I, I shared the link to the auto law uh, kind of uh, preprint on archive. Uh, so if people want to dig into it, um, they are welcome to. Um, there are also some questions in the chat. I can uh, I can start with those uh, while people think. Um, Chris asked how how widely distributed are the NLP uh, based tools. Um, I, I I think it's hard to say right because a lot of it is proprietary. Uh, certainly, kind of the for profit legal research uh, companies are are saying that they're doing NLP. There's uh, you know more and more interest from the NLP community. Uh, what doesn't seem to exist is kind of uh, widely accessible, free or nearly free tools um, that people can use. Um, and, and there are, you know, maybe reasons to that. And you, you mentioned the barriers. Uh, that, you know, this is kind of a whole conversation in and of itself. But uh, I, I think there's a resistance to relying on technology. And I think that that is reasonable. Um, you know, lawyers don't want to uh, get sued for, for malpractice, for example, because they relied on some tool. Um, so, so there are certainly barriers there. But uh, it, it seems like there's a growing uh, desire to use tools like this. Um, Robert, are there any other jurisdictions that you know about that are a bit more forward thinking in applying this kind of technology? Maybe you'd like smaller countries with more, uh, less regulated legal systems. Uh, the short answer is no, I've looked a little bit. Um, we, we once explored doing a collaboration with uh, some Pacific islands because they uh, are very small and they also have common law systems. But, uh, it, you know, and, and maybe, maybe uh, we'll put it over the edges, you know, a, a trip to Kiribati wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Um, but uh, it, it never materialized. So uh, if, if folks are aware of jurisdictions that are interested in kind of experimenting, um, I'd, be, I'd be super interested. Uh, one of the issues is data, right? Uh, so, so if you want to do any of this, you need to have access to data. We once uh, in, initiated kind of conversations with Rwanda, um, also a common law jurisdiction. Um, and there it turned out that, uh, especially uh, post-genocide, uh, a lot of the case law wasn't even uh, like typed. It was uh, they, because they had to have these emergency courts. Um, and so a lot of that was written down by hand. Um, and then uh, it, that was compounded by the challenge that the uh, language, uh, Kenya Rwanda, is uh, spoken by so few people that a lot of the NLP tools we have available to us, like BERT wouldn't work. Um, so, so that's a real issue. Um, but we're we're exploring it. <laughs> uh, someone you should, yeah, someone you should reach out to is Steve Tendon. Um, he's working with the Marshall Islands on some crypto related projects, but I just checked in their common law jurisdiction. So um, that might be a good signal uh, that they're interested in doing something. Um, yeah, one, one step beyond that is look at anywhere that's implementing a CDBC, such yeah. a bank digital currency now, because they may also be in a similar legal situation to uh, uh, be forward thinking with that legal system. And we've started doing more work on, on CBDCs. It strikes us as a good example of uh, a lot of this. Indeed. Yeah. And, we, and we happen to have a sitting judge with us. Uh, uh, Renata, did you uh, have uh, something to contribute? Yeah, well, I was just wondering if you, if you have ever tried this too with any civil law jurisdiction and if you would happen to find uh, a source of open data that maybe it would make this, all this resource in research a lot easier. For instance, in Brazil, we've, we've got 18,000 judges and 78 million lawsuits going on. And that would be just amazing just to have all this data and this citation collected and built upon, you know. I mean, yeah, I, it, it, I, just, it just got me wondering here, you know. Yeah, Maybe we I haven't just... tried this. We haven't tried this on, on civil, uh, in, in, in the civil law context. And uh, we, we ought to. Uh, I think we're just less familiar with it. And we're, we're looking for kind of like someone who can show us the way. 
um, for because presumably the <laughs> okay excellent yeah um, no I I'd love to explore this more um, and and figure out you know because because I I don't really have a good understanding of how the you know how we would have to think about citations in a civil law context um, I to can make totally this help you with yeah. that I mean just. Yeah. If you if you wish, I mean, I, yeah. I, I don't know. No, I, I'd be. I, I'd love to. I'd love to kind of engage in the conversation. Absolutely. And yeah. I know that there's like an instrument. Uh, there's an, a specific institution that's actually working with AI, and maybe we could just try to gather things up. and And it's part of the structure of the justice. I would have just to check how things are going because it changes every couple of years, something like that. But I mean, I, I believe that this could be a real game changer for a place like Brazil. And it's like, it's crazy here. Yeah, yeah no, I think it could be a game changer for lots of places, um, unfortunately. But, but absolutely yeah. not. I, you know, and then there's basic questions like availability of data. Um, and, and, you know, also somebody who, who needs to speak Portuguese, right? Like there's, uh, it's surprising how much you can, yeah. <laughs> there's a surprising how much you can do with NLP if you don't speak the like relevant languages, but uh, uh, only so much, especially in the legal context, I think it's- Yeah, yeah. This is just, uh, this is amazing uh, because of access to justice. And that's just something that gets me every, every single time. So congratulations on the project. I just wanted just kudos on that. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. No, hopefully, Daza, you can put us in touch and, and we can explore. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I see a, a nod and I, we don't require much, in, much encouragement, so I will put you in touch. Um, and just one other little thought there is, and I know we have talked um, um, in, in, in very broad ways about, uh, you know, could we repeat this with um, statutes and regulations in a different way? Um, you know, obviously, it's a citation network, but, you know, there are but you know, statutes and regs are a critical part of, of the law and they're frequently what's cited too, right? Um, mm -hmm. And you can cite from them, especially when you look at the, the paid databases. And so, and they do provide like a, a real ontology and, and like proper rules of law. And yeah, obviously that's gonna like take a lot more, you know, thinking through that that may be among the last things we do in, in, in common law jurisdictions. In a civil law jurisdiction, you know, maybe there'd be far fewer steps uh, needed because of the nature of the framework being, you know, so, um, you know, comprehensive. So maybe we, maybe it might be worth um, reaching out even more closely to our to our friends and colleagues in Brazil, for example, um, to see if the if there's a team up there uh, that in the future, or, or or even just to help articulate the questions and possible approaches, even if we didn't take it forward in a in in the development phase. Uh, ha it has its own advantages. So I really do encourage you all to keep pulling on that string. It's, it's I think, very promising. And fundamentally, it's like adding a second access to the um, corpus of law. Uh, yep. yeah. uh, okay, more. Okay, and, and so, and I notice uh, that, boy, that was the fastest 52 minutes of, like, my recent life. Uh, so thank you. But we do want to kind of pivot a little bit now, or not pivot, we want to um, save some time for composable governance. So I just want to thank you again um, on behalf of uh, you know the whole community, Robert, for taking the time to explain this so well. And um, and as uh, uh, Renita said, kudos on, um, on on really digging in 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 I think like uh, in like the MIT spirit uh, in, into computational law and building something that we can react to. So thank you and like, oh, thank you so uh, much. And yeah, thank you for giving on. me the opportunity. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. Here, cool. And so now, um, uh, giving the mic to the person I so rudely interrupted, uh, whose instincts were right on target in terms of what is the coolest thing to talk about, just maybe slightly premature. It's not premature anymore for Brian Wilson, our editor in chief of the MIT Computational Law Report, who had yet another awesome idea <laughs> about what we should be doing. Um, and it's, I'll just say the name and then hand the baton composable governance. What yeah. is it? How are we going to do it, man? So I think that's really what we're trying to figure out. We, during the IAP course, just announced a new call for submissions to an exciting um, project, uh, the Collected Works on Composable Governance. And here, what we're really trying to get to is um, to cut through some of the uh, 
cut through some of the myth and um, understand more of the, the cool aspects of what's happening with some of these Web3 innovations um, that are taking place right now. Um, because there is a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that needs to be made sense of, and um, and I think here, you know, some of what we're doing is sense making. You know, there isn't a really great definition for what composable governance is. So, in the coming weeks, we'll be releasing something akin to an FAQ where we start to answer some of these questions. We'll start speaking with people, getting some recorded videos out there of what does composable governance mean to you? Because I think in different contexts, it'll mean different things. Um, for regulators, it'll mean something completely different than it does to people who are building things. Um, and that will mean something completely different to than it does to lawyers. And that'll mean something completely different than it does um, to business people. And so um, I would encourage anybody who's interested to engage in the Telegram channel that we have um, for computational law um, you can find that on the um, contact page, I believe. Um, it's either in the contact page or the about page. Um, I might have, uh, there, there's a page and I'll find it and I'll post the link. But before uh, we run out of time, I want to kick it over to um, Wasim because he's, his column is about um, a lot of these uh, these governance mishaps and what what happens when they go wrong and exploring and disentangling um, the bad from the good and so we'll see it's it's over to you yeah thanks so we don't have so, so much time so maybe I'll just give a little a little taster so I suppose um, the column that I wrote I'll just post the link in the in the zoom chat is the first in a series on on miss, miss brackets miss adventures in crypto governance um, trying to you know uh, go beyond good and bad like you know they're all it's all experiments it's all very early stage technology it's very speculative and we don't know the outcomes of these experiments you know as we embark on them in, in good faith or otherwise um and i would say that uh, i started off like you know with the simplest case which is bitcoin and i would say that this is kind of a case of where modularity of governance compos and composability of governance is absent so we don't have there's, there's no governance in bitcoin it's everything is off chain relies on uh, human coordination outside the network and we just rely on the incentives that Bitcoin mining provides to the various stakeholders in the network that the kind of partial alignment of the different uh, stakeholders in the group it's kind of creates a Mexican standoff and so like you know the devs have guns pointed at the miners the miners have guns pointed at the exchanges and so on and the thing just keeps spitting out coins to keep everyone happy enough uh, to stop the, the the thing from descending into uh, literally anarchy um, and you know, there's this really helpful concept, which I'm sure many of you have come across before, uh, the ty tyranny of structurelessness. And this is kind of a way of describing this kind of governance minimized space, like in Bitcoin, where there is no uh, set of, you know, there's no way of, you know, can't, there's nobody that's gonna answer your proposal. There's nobody that's gonna uh, assign you funds or, or give you reputation or give you credibility for doing X, Y, or Z inside the network. So you're relying on everything happening uh, outside it so you're kind of navigating this structuralist space uh, which is not empty it's just that everything is poorly defined you know so you've got like norms and you've got um kind of uh you know hidden agendas and uh, technical limitations and you're just trying to find your way uh, around this and so there's one concept which um uh, came up in the bitcoin space uh, nick zabo uh, one of the progenitors of bitcoin who created uh, uh, digicash uh, came up with this idea of uh, so we talk about um, attack surfaces with uh, crypto networks and other kinds of computational systems. Well, he was talking about an argument surface. So think about governance in terms of complexity. And uh, he was trying to use it, frame it in a good way, saying the less governance, the better, because the more complicated the system is, uh, the more uh, vulnerabilities there are, whether they're technical or they're social or they're somewhere in between. Uh, but having this idea of this minimized argument surface um, is all well and good. But um, unless you have some kind of way of helping uh, the stakeholders, whether they're human or, or otherwise, uh, 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 reach agreements and, and make decisions, uh, you just end up in this kind of perpetual, uh, uh, best Mexican standoff, and at worst, a uh, civil war. And the civil wars in blockchain systems are forks. And you've probably heard about hard forks before, like Ethereum had one when the DAO uh, collapsed in 2016. Uh, Bitcoin had one in uh, late 2017, I believe it was, uh, early 2018, uh, over the disagreement over the scaling 
uh, pathways for the network in terms of the block size uh, of each Bitcoin block. And um, unless you've got some kind of way of like, you know, uh, a, a du jour system or something like that within these networks, then you're always going to end up in these kind of tyranny of structurelessness, uh, uh, you know, human off-chain coordination moments. And I'll give you an extreme example of how badly things can go wrong when there's no governance inside the system, uh, which is a paper from, I believe it was 2017-18 uh, by Patrick McCory and colleagues. It's called Smart Contracts for Bribing Miners. And the idea in this, this uh, paper is that you can use incentives on Ethereum with smart contracts, automate the algorithmic incentives to corrupt the game theory balance of incentives on Bitcoin. Because we, we know that Bitcoin inside the system, the incentives work, but if people start like stuffing other people's pockets with cash outside the system, you may not be acting in this kind of economically rational uh, way anymore. And so I think that's another, another really interesting kind of uh, pause for thought that, you know, these networks also don't exist in a vacuum. They also exist among other networks and they also exist among you know, jurisdictions and legal systems and, you know, uh, central bank currencies and uh, all the rest of it. And uh, so, yeah, I don't have any solutions, I'm afraid. I, I just, uh, my, I set my store out by um, uh, foregrounding the problems. Uh, so maybe I'm I'm useless here. Maybe I'm just a critic and I'm, I'm not really helpful. Uh, but I will promise to continue to unpack uh, more uh, governance uh, maladies uh, as we as we go through the, uh, the column series. And we'll be getting next to uh, Ethereum, the DAO, and then all the DAOs that we're seeing now, uh, which are, you know, uh, flourishing or expiring, depending on fate on pretty much a daily basis, as I'm sure you've seen in the news. I'll wrap there. Thanks. You're here. Thank you so much, Brian and, and Wasim, for, for uh, sharing with the community um, through IdeaFlow. Uh, what, what's been going on in the MIT Computational Law Report with respect to governance on Wasim's beat and his uh, column, which is off to a terrific start? Uh, and I might just say one more point. Uh, you know, ordinarily, you, you know, like our vibe is more like, let's build, not sit back in our armchairs and critique everything all day. But there's a balance there. And I, I think our friend Elizabeth Ranieris has been a good example of how, you know, critique is a critical input to design uh, as well. It, in fact, it can be a constructive source of requirements and constraints and, uh, and, and describing, you know, how we would test a system that operated in a way that um, addresses or maybe even transcends what the dead ends of the past have been. So I think it's, it's incredibly useful. It's also a really entertaining column. And Brian, most especially for having the leadership and creativity to articulate this, this very cool um, uh, direction of inquiry. So uh, everybody that, everyone, I encourage you to participate in this. How do you participate? Um, number one, uh, write something about this uh, and then submit it um, at, at the um, law.mit.edu forward slash composable governance link that um, Brian has shared. But Better yet, um, Brian uh, is uh, and uh, and the rest of the team are going to be emailing you and talking in future idea flows about more sort of like incremental things we'll do, like little symposia, kind of discussion events, um, other kind of sort of maybe ask me any things where we can just have open discussions on the topic and get more iterative input and um, and start to flesh out these things. Uh, there's a lot more to say about that and so much more in computational law, but we're out of time today. So uh, thank you again, everybody, for participating. And we, we so look forward to seeing you at next month's last Friday, 12 p.m. Eastern time, Idea Flow. Until then, I'm going to wish you well. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. See ya.